Yeah, thank you for the introduction and um, welcome to this talk where I will uh, tell you about results, so experimental results on the correlated dynamics uh, in two different settings of strongly interacting quantum systems. So I'm from uh, the group of Hans Christoph Nagel at the University of Innsbruck and uh, I'm going to start uh, with a slide showing you the different kind of directions we pursue in our group. So we have actually three um, quantum gas experiments, two of them dealing with, um, uh, with mixtures of potassium and cesium and rubidium and cesium and are, um, are aiming uh, to uh, produce uh, ultra-cold molecules, in particular dipolar molecules with long-range interactions in optical lattice potentials. But I'm actually from this lab where we have a cesium experiment, a single species experiment in an optical lattice, so I have to apologize that in this talk, um, I will talk about particles with short-range interactions. Um, but I hope that I can convince you that we can still do interesting physics with short-range interacting ground state atoms in these lattice potentials. So let me uh, um, start with this little sketch. Uh, so what we want to uh, explore in, in, in this uh, setting is the dynamics of interacting, short-range interacting particles on a lattice and uh, what they can actually do in this, uh, in this lattice landscape, which we engineer uh, with uh, laser beams, uh, is that they can tunnel from side to side, so they can move uh, through the lattice through uh, quantum tunneling, and whenever you have two of them on the same side, they're going to interact with each other strongly. And uh, so, in a way, this is a kind of um, a synthetic condensed matter system uh, that we um, engineer here and that we try to study and in particular in situations out of equilibrium. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with these kind of systems and tell you about um, experiments that we did in the past on correlated tunneling dynamics in tilted mod insulating Hubbard chains. And then I will quickly switch to um, new uh, results where we looked on um, systems with driven particle interactions and it turned out that we can create um, a, a Hubbard Hamiltonian with occupation dependent tunneling terms and uh, so this will be the second part and then I will switch to a different kind of setting where we look not on lattice system but actually on um, on tubes of one dimensional uh, systems um, with strong particle interactions and strong correlations and in this kind of uh, setting uh, we have recently observed block oscillation of an, the block oscillation dynamics of impu impurities that are immersed in such a correlated background, yeah, such a correlated system. So let me start on the first part. Um, so to those of you who are not that familiar with uh, these cold atoms and optical lattices, let me recap a little bit the, uh, the model that we used to, uh, to, um, to, to compare experiments to theory. So these atoms sitting on a lattice are actually well described uh, by the bose hubbard Hamiltonian um, and this Hamiltonian consists of two terms. The first term describes the motion of the particles through the lattice via tunneling. So we have a nearest neighbor tunneling uh, process with a, t with a single particle tunneling rate J. And uh, whenever we have two of them, two of those uh, atoms on the same lattice side, they interact short range um, and this interaction energy is quantified typically by, um, uh, by the interaction energy U. Uh. And then for some of our experiments, what we actually do to initiate dynamics in these systems is we apply a, a, a tilt. Uh, we tilt the whole system and apply an energy offset from one side to the other, which we quantify by E. And uh, we do this in the experiment by a magnetic force that acts on the atoms. All right. So um, I'd like to emphasize here that what we have actually in our lab is, is so the realization of a Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian with three different parameters that we can tune independently. Yeah? We can tune the, the tunneling rate by the lattice depth. We can tune interactions by means of so-called Feshbach resonances. Um, and we can uh, certainly tune this tilt by varying this magnetic force. What we've done in the past in these systems is we looked on quench dynamics in tilted mod insulating Hubbard chain. So we started with um, a system with exactly one particle in each side um, so mod insulator uh, for which uh, the interaction energy is much larger than the tunneling rate. And then the ground state of, of the system is uh, such an array of atoms where, uh, where each side is exactly occupied by a single particle. And then we applied this tilt to the system. Yeah? So we tilted it and you can imagine when this tilt is sufficiently weak and in particular uh, much weaker than the interaction energy then just nothing happens. Yeah? But interesting dynamics can now 
happen in the system um, when this tilt, so this, this energy offset from side to side, just compensates for the interaction energy. Because then you can imagine that when you have a particle, for example, sitting initially in this side here to the very left, it can tunnel onto its neighbor in a resonant fashion. And in a resonant way, I mean that the energy it needs to occupy this, uh, this side with two particles, yeah, the, the on-site interaction energy U is just delivered by this energy offset, by the tilt. So it's a, it's a resonant tunneling process, but it's also a correlated tunneling process because it can only happen when this neighboring side is initially populated. Huh? So there's a constraint on the tunneling dynamics. And we have actually um, studied many body, many body dynamics in these tilted settings on resonance. Um, so, so particularly, we have started in this one atom per side mod insulator, and then we have quickly quenched the system onto this point where E equals U. And then we have counted the number of doubly occupied sites, huh? what we call a doublon as a function of time after the quench. And what you see then in the experiment is that this number of W occupied sites oscillates and decays. Uh, so this is, this is many body tunneling dynamics in the system where the particles tunnel back and forth onto their neighbor in this resonant fashion. And, um, and you can do this also a bit detuned from resonance by, you, by changing a bit the value of the tilt. Yeah, so this blue line was really where E equals U, but then you can do this a bit detuned and these oscillations become faster and the, the amplitude goes down. So this was really stuff we did in the past, and um, what I'd like to emphasize here is that these tunneling oscillations, these correlated tunneling processes, uh, to a very good approximation, essentially happen with a rate that is the single particle tunneling rate, so this J in the Hubbard model. Uh, so it can be used, for example, as a direct measure in the experiment to, to, to measure the tunneling rate, if you wish. But um, what we wanted to, uh, what we thought about um, more recently is, can we actually engineer a system um, where, these, the, where the tunneling of the particles does not happen with J, but becomes actually dependent, uh, so the tunneling rate becomes dependent on the number of particles in neighboring sites. Uh, so, so in this sense, can we engineer a Hubbard model with an occupation-dependent tunneling rate? That was kind of the question. And um, the way we did that is by uh, using a fast drive in the system, um, and employ the idea of, of what is uh, now um, in this cold atom business um, kind of termed Floquet engineering. Yeah? So we use a quickly driven system, periodically driven system, uh, to engineer such an occupation-dependent uh, tunneling rate. And uh, what has done in the past, um, uh, to remind you a bit, is people have controlled in this way, in this, uh, by, the, by driving the system, the single particle tunneling rate. Yeah? And this is often called the kind of shaken lattices. Yeah? So what you do is you take your optical lattice and you shake it back and forth very quickly. And then you can make such a Floquet um, analysis of the system and you'll figure out that um, you can engineer a kind of a system where you have a new effective tunneling rate that is the bare tunneling rate multiplied by a Bessel function. And in the argument of the Bessel function, you have the strengths of this drive. Yeah? So by the strengths of, the, of, of, your, of your shaking, you can kind of coherently control the tunneling rate, the single particle tunneling rate. So this has been done and has been used now in many different labs, for example, to drive quantum phase transitions from superfluid to mod insulating states, um, to uh, study uh, classical um, forms of frustrated magnetism on triangular lattices, uh, to um, implement artificial gauge fields, uh, even to implement now topological um, models such as the Haldane model, or to um, engineer spin-dependent um, uh, spin dependent tunneling and lattices. Yeah, so this is really just to sketch how, uh, how wide this field of Floquet engineering is now kind of explored in this cold atom uh, business. And uh, what we wanted to add now is a tool to um, kind of use these methods to engineer occupation-dependent tunneling and not just the single particle tunneling rate. And we do this not by shaking, shaking the lattice, but so to say shaking the particle interactions. Yeah. So we uh, look on a system with periodically modulated interactions. Um, what, what that means is we have our Hubbard use, the, the on-site interaction energy, and we modulate this now in time yeah, with, a, with a certain amplitude and a frequency. And we do this sinusoidally in the lab. And then uh, for um, when, when this drive, uh, so the drive frequency is much larger than the original Hubbard parameters, U and J, we can do a similar kind of Floquet analysis as in these shaken lattices. 
And you, what you're going to end up is a new uh, kinetic term in the Hubbard model that has this particular form. So you, you can uh, recognize the tunneling uh, part. So here's uh, the um, relation creation operators on neighboring lattice I and J. This was the bare tunneling rate, but now you see that the tunneling rate um, is now modified again by a Bessel function. And in the argument of the Bessel function, you have the strength of the drive. Yeah? So here's the, the amplitude of the modulation. But also in the argument, you find now the number um, of particles on the left and the right side that, uh, that um, uh, contribute to the tunneling. So in this sense, you can make now this, this term really uh, occupation dependent. And uh, what that means is that you, when you look now at different types of tunneling processes, for example, when you have a particle that wants to hop onto a site which is already occupied, this tunneling rate will scale like uh, this um, blue curve with the modulation strength. But when this site is occupied by two particles, there will be a factor of two in here, and uh, the scaling will be different. Huh? So in this sense, you can coherently um, uh, um, engineer a system uh, with well-controlled occupation-dependent tunneling parameters. And the way we do this is we again start in a mod insulator with a single site occupation in the limit of large interactions. And then we quickly switch off the interactions be between the particles. Yeah? So we make them non-interacting. And what happens then is that they can start to delocalize in the lattice. They can start to tunnel. Yeah? They, they are not blocked anymore by their mutual interactions. And this will lead to the decay of particles with, uh, of, of sites with single, uh, single occupancy and the buildup of multiple occupancies in the system. We use this decay to actually measure now the tunneling rate in the presence of this modulated interactions. Yeah? So um, what I show here is the normalized number of single, single occupancies in the system or single sites in the system. And when we don't drive the, sy uh, the, the system and you don't shake interactions and you see this quick decay, yeah, it will be uh, accompanied by a raise of double occupancy, but uh, the singlons actually decay. And you extract, when you extract a rate, you can, um, uh, you can plot this here. Uh, so this will be this data point, and now we do this experiment in the presence of some modulated interactions with an amplitude delta u, uh, some particular frequency. And when we switch on this drive now, we can see that the um, singlon decay is... is, is um, significantly reduced, so this gives rise to this data point here in the decay rate. We can even completely freeze the system, although the mean interaction strength is zero. Yeah? Um, but, uh, but essentially, because of this uh, drive, it's kind of frozen due to um, uh, their neighboring particles. Yeah? So that's the green line here and gives rise to this data point. And we can go on and on and take more, more data sets. Um, and if you take points also in between, then you can get, then you get this type of behavior can do this also at the different drive frequency that shifts the whole thing, it scales a bit differently. But essentially, we uh, recover this Bessel function uh, dynamic, this Bessel function scaling of the tunneling rate. And again, I'd like to emphasize here that this is only because there's neighboring atoms in the lattice, huh? because you have this many body system. If there would be just one particle and you drive your interactions, it will just tunnel as it. With a, with, a, with a single particle tunneling rate. Huh? So this is really due to the correlations in the lattice and the fact that you have many particles. So um, it would be nice actually to see now directly the scaling with, uh, with the occupation number also, not only with the drive strengths, but also with the occupation number. And um, we do this again by applying our, our tilt trick. Huh? So essentially we start now with an initial state that is not a one atom per side mod insulator, but that is more or less kind of a random distribution of single, single occupancy, some holes, and some uh, sites with two particles on it. Huh? Then we can um, tilt the system so that this energy offset is again um, uh, um, equal to the, in, to, to the interaction energy. And then we, uh, we can drive tunneling processes where a particle hops onto sites where there's just one atom. If we double this tilt to 2U, uh, you can see that now a particle can hop onto a site where there's two particles already. Yeah? So this kind of allows us in the, in the experiment to differentiate or to, to, um, uh, to um, isolate tunneling processes uh, um, of, of the form where a particle hops onto a site with two bosons or a particle hops onto a site with just one atom. Yeah? And those, those tunnel in the presence of this drive now, 
uh, those uh, tunneling rates um, should uh, scale differently. In particular, there should be a factor of two in here because you have two particles here and not just one. And uh, indeed, we, we, we can do this. So what is, what is plotted here actually is kind of the number after we, after we do this tilt and yeah, we wait for a certain time and then we plot the number of doubly occupied sites as a function of this tilt and we see then two resonances. Yeah? One would correspond to exactly this process where we create doublons in the system. Yeah? So one, one goes to two, zero. And the other resonance would be um, corresponding to the process where two particle, uh, two, one goes to three, zero. So we lose doublons. Yeah? This is these two resonances. And now we can do this, uh, we, we can actually look on the height of these resonances as a function of the drive again. And then we see these uh, different scaling. Yeah? So that's the drive, that's the height of these resonances normalized. And then we see the different scaling, and we can actually recover this type of vessel um, function rescaling or occupation dependent tunneling in the lattice. Um, so this was kind of, of the first part uh, where, we, uh, where we kind of engineered um, a Hubbard model with occupation dependent tunneling, and that opens now uh, various um, new. Uh, um, various playgrounds to actually look on the phase diagram of such Hubbard models with occupation-dependent tunneling, which should exhibit uh, phases of dimer superfluidity and, and, and various other regions in, in, in the phase diagram. Or it could potentially lead uh, to, um, uh, to new, um, new, yeah, new tools to engineer gauge fields, where the gauge field is actually um, density-dependent. Yeah? So kind of a dynamical gauge field with a density dependence in it. This has a little um, outlook yeah, on this. But now I'd like to switch gears and switch to the, uh, to the other type of setting uh, we were recently studying. Um, and this was um, not these, uh, these Bose-Hubbard systems and dynamics in these Bose-Hubbard systems, but actually um, arrays of, of homo homogeneous or let's say um, translationally invariant um, uh, one-dimensional uh, tube-like systems. Huh? So we, we do this by two uh, laser beams, which are or reach reflected laser beams, which are um, horizontally propagating, and this gives rise uh, to a lattice in which we create these tube-like systems, isolated tube-like systems. And uh, what we uh, wanted to, um, to observe in there is um, what happens if we, um, if we create an impurity particle in this 1D Bose gas, and, uh, and, and drive this by a force, and then we were interested in the dynamics of such an impurity particle um, in, immersed in such a 1D Bose gas. And, uh, before I show you the, the experimental results, uh, let me uh, quickly remind you a bit to, uh, to the physics of these 1D um, systems of strongly interacting bosons. Uh, so what, what you have when you have this knob to, to, um, to change the interactions between the particles is that you can engineer a situation in the laboratory where you have these bosons actually non-interacting. Yeah? So you, the scattering length is, is set to zero, and then you have a non-interacting Bose gas, um, and so in principle, an ideal gas in 1D. Uh, and then you can crank up these interactions. You can make the scattering lengths larger and larger and larger. And at some point, you'll end up in a regime which is known as a so-called Tong-Girado gas, where the, particle, where the interactions between the particles um, is basically infinitely repulsive. Yeah? And because you're in this 1D setting, uh, you can, in principle, think of the, that the particles can't hop around each other, yeah? so they, they can't get around each other. And this leads to the fact that um, when they are strongly repulsive, um, the effect of, of, of correlations uh, become important. Yeah? So, um, so you basically um, end up in a regime with strong particle correlations. Uh, one can actually even map this to a gas of non-interacting fermions where, so to say, the, 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 the Pauli blockade uh, results from this strong repulsive interactions of the bosons. Uh, that's why it's some, sometimes also called fermionized Bose gas. And in the, in the, um, uh, in the context of these 1D um, uh, of these 1D bosons, the strength of these interactions is typically parameterized by a dimensionless parameter, which, is, uh, which I label here with gamma, which is zero in the non-interacting limit and goes to infinity in the strongly interacting limit. 
the experiment we had in mind was now to be in this regime where particle correlations become important um, and create a single impurity particle in this Tongs gas and then um, subject this impurity particle to a force and see what happens. And on the next slide, I'd like to sketch a bit what we uh, expected to see or what, what, what uh, interesting physics can actually happen in the motion of such an impurity particle immersed in this strongly correlated uh, background gas. So an intuition what could happen uh, can be uh, drawn when you look on the dispersion relation or the excitation spectrum of, uh, of this many-body system. Uh, if you look on it, uh, so what is plotted here is as a function of, of the system's total momentum, uh, um, the energy of the excitations in the system, and, uh, and it turns out in the context of these uh, one, strongly correlated 1D systems um, that uh, the, um, uh, the low energy excitations obey actually such a cosine shaped uh, periodic um, uh, excitation spectrum. Huh? And um, so, so in, in, in particular, you have for any non-zero momentum, you have, you have a gap, yeah? so these excitations are gap, and when you uh, approach twice uh, the, the, the Fermi momentum in the system, yeah? so I said before, these bosons are very kind of comparable to free fermions, so you can introduce actually a Fermi momentum, which depends on the density. They have this periodic, periodic shape of the, of the excitation spectrum. And this reminds you um, very much uh, to the situation in a lattice. Huh? Because when you, uh, when you put um, a quantum particle in a lattice, um, you, you'll get a, this, this quantum particle will feel a band structure. Huh? Plotted here is a single wave packet, a single quantum particle that is uh, placed in a lattice potential, and then you have your Briolin zones and your band structure of the lattice. Huh? And if you now restrict yourself just to the lowest band, then this, uh, this um, kind of uh, picture is a bit identical, similar. Yeah? So you have a periodic dispersion relation. And um, if we now drive this analog further, and you have your um, quantum particle sitting in this band structure, what happens if you uh, expose it to a force is that you will actually drive it through the Briolin zone. And once you reach the zone edge, you get Bragg reflections on the other side. And this motion of the, of the quantum particle in this lattice structure will be periodic uh, in momentum space. Yeah? And uh, so this is known as what is called as Bloch oscillations. Yeah? And uh, the, the Bloch oscillation frequency actually depends on the drive strength, on the force, but also on the lattice spacing. Yeah? And now you can make this analogon. So what happens to our impurity when we drive it uh, with the force, you can imagine that it follows this uh, dispersion relation and, um, and go, undergo some oscillatory dynamics and uh, again you can make this analogon and say then the effective block frequency would be the drive and, uh, but, and, and depending on the drive and the density in the system. Yeah? And, uh, but there is some difficulties because differently to the lattice uh, um, situation, there is a whole um, continuum of excitations above this low energy spectral edge. Yeah? And this can be excited in the course of the quantum evolution. So the question is really, although we have no imprinted lattice structure, the, the dispersion is still periodic. Um, so this could give rise to block oscillations of this impurity particle. But can they survive, actually? Because there is, there is this uh, um, continuum of excitations on top that can be excited. Yeah? So we do experiments now. By, um, uh, by actually exciting this impurity in a different spin state. So we apply a radio frequency pulse. So this is our correlated background gas, our bosons, but the black dots. And we, we um, um, kind of excite a single impurity in each of these tubes in a different, uh, hyper, in a different um, uh, hyperfine spin state. And due to the different magnetic moments of the background gas and this impurity, it will uh, experience a force downwards. Huh? It will be accelerated. Then we can do time of flight and actually map out the impurity momentum distribution as a function of time. And, uh, we can do this um, for various different interaction strengths. So this is actually the scattering lengths of our um, background, so background background collisions and collisions between the background and the impurity atom, and tuned by a magnetic field yeah, in the lab. So um, this is to that we can actually engineer this uh, this interaction parameter by changing the scattering length. 
So the simplest scenario would be a free fall, so to say. Yeah? So when we um, are on a point where the interactions are zero be between the impurity and the host atoms, and uh, then what we see is actually that so this is um, impurity momentum as a function of time just obeys a linear evolution. Yeah? It increases linearly with time, so it basically this resembles a situation where the um, uh, background gas is made transparent to the impurity. If you increase interactions now, what we see is that a part of this impurity wave packet, after some time, uh, gets actually Bragg reflected. Huh? And it gets Bragg reflected by just twice the Fermi momentum. So this is uh, essentially this effective Briolin zone you get in this uh, 1D fermionized system. And if you increase interactions, this Bragg reflected part becomes stronger and stronger. And in the deep, in the strongly correlated regime, uh, you'll see that you get really this type of oscillatory motion uh, with these Bragg reflections of the impurity on the background gas, yeah, on the correlated background gas. And uh, we can compare this to numerics, and it fits really nicely. There are some slight quantitative differences due to um, imperfections, but uh, the overall comparison is very nice. Um, we can also extract the mean impurity momentum as a function of time, and then we see these oscillatory uh, dynamics also in the mean momentum. We can compare again to, to uh, numerically exact calculations of the problem, and um, amplitude and time scales also fit very nicely. We can actually really now um, extract uh, the, uh, the frequency of these oscillations as a function of the force to some extent, and uh, compare with these uh, simple predictions from this uh, idea that uh, you, un you go like um, periodically through this dispersion relation of the coupled system. And it, 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 um, kind of in conclusion, what we see is block oscillations of a single impurity particle on the correlated uh, background gas, right? in the absence of any lattice. And I find that quite amazing. Um, OK, that's the team working on this. Uh, from the experiment, and there's also a very a lot of theory input, uh, mainly from Andrew Daly. And I'd like to thank Eugene Demmler, Michael Knapp, and uh, Misha Swonarev uh, for valuable, extremely valuable theory input in, on, on this uh, work on the block oscillating impurity. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.